Call the health committee meeting for order. December 6, 9.30 a.m. Welcome to the new member um, for the health committee. Um, I tend to come to the health committee and just report whatever is going on at the health department along with, uh, along with our members and things like that. But if there's ever something that as new members you want to see or you have any suggestions, I'm certainly open to this. Um, I thought that I would give at least the new members a copy of our annual report from last year. Um, if anybody else wants one, here's an extra one. Um, but I didn't bring those because I know you guys have gotten them several times. Um, so we are required by the Illinois Department of Public Health every year um, to publish an annual report um, 90 days, supposedly 90 days after um, the end of the fiscal year. So that's last year. We'll be doing that this year. Last year, because there was no state budget, even though it was a like state budget, they gave all the health departments a, um, a waiver, um, and they could um, put in the annual report then whenever they had the resources to do that. So um, if you, for the new members, if you kind of you know, read the paper a lot, and um, we're aware, a lot of the local health departments throughout the state of Illinois last year, over 50% of them ended up having to lay off staff um, or cut programs or cut service hours. Our health department was very fortunate. Um, we did not have to do, to do that. And obviously you're aware that um, financially we're stable. So um, we feel very, 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 very fortunate that we didn't have to, to cut services for the county residents. Um, so to tell you a little bit about the health department, and for those of you, I apologize for those of you that have heard this many times, but I thought that I would give everyone a copy of the reportable disease list. Um, um, so I thought that was a good place to start. The Illinois Reportable Disease List is a list of diseases that are reportable by law to your local health department within a specific time frame. So as you'll notice, the diseases, if you actually look at the list of diseases, behind it in parentheses you'll see a time frame, 24 hours, 7 days, 10 days, whatever. Um, those are the time periods that um, either a physician's office, a, ho a hospital, or a clinic, or um, a laboratory has to report to their the local health department that they have a someone who's tested positive for that disease. Now, a few years ago, that really changed for Illinois. Um, historically, those, that information came right from the doctor's office or from a nurse or somebody that, that picked up the phone and called the health department. But several years ago, um, the, the Illinois Department of Public Health mandated that the laboratories who do the testing for these diseases, um, whether they're testing you know, a, a specimen that's biological or a, an animal specimen or, or whatever, that if, that if someone tests positive for any of those things on that list, they are required by law to enter that information into a system called INED. Um, the rest of the health committee is very familiar with INED. Are you, are you familiar with INED? INED is the Illinois National Electronic Disease Surveillance System. In Kansas, it's KNED. Okay. So this system is a computer system that we open up every morning at the health department. Um, it's very, obviously very um, HIPAA protected and password protected, so it takes a lot of <coughs> into the system. But it will tell me everyone in Iroquois County who, who resides in Iroquois County who has any type of communicable disease. Well, even if you've tested positive for chicken for, for varicella. That's oh, that's reported. Well, the hospital reported. But if they test positive. The, the laboratories are now required to report it, who, te who do the testing. Because now it, it isn't just, um, and, I'll, and I'll show you that, I'll explain that to you 
in detail in just a minute. Like for varicella is on the list. Okay, varicella is chicken pox. We only had, recently had one reported case of varicella because that's laboratory confirmed. A lot of people take their kids to the doctor. The doctor diagnoses chicken pox and they don't draw blood on a kid. So obviously, we're, um, we only get the report in INED um, or from the, the hospital if, if it's laboratory confirmed. So nowadays, there are hundreds of more cases than what are reported to the health department. We only are required by law to investigate the cases that are laboratory confirmed. We also get a call from a doctor that, that will notify us of something, even if it's not laboratory confirmed and the doctor knows about it. We'll implement those same prevention and control measures. You know, we'll do the investigation. So this is nationwide, obviously, because if you had something done, let's say you had a test on the floor, <laughs> you yes. find your address. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it, 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 when the information is entered into INET, it, it lists the person's complete identifying information. So, so it lists the town, you know, not only the, the state and the county you live in, but it lists the town that you live in in your address. So that'll populate and then whatever county enters that information. Let's say that a laboratory in Champaign is testing somebody who lives in your Clay County. Champaign or Banner Public Health Department will, will then transfer that case to us. So it's reported from Iroquois County, wherever the person's residence is? Yes. Usually the laboratory reports it into the system, and if, if they know where we live, you know, but like little towns like, like Wellington, for example, I grew up in Wellington, so a little town like Wellington, somebody from the lab in Champaign may not know exactly where Wellington is, so they'll, they'll put it in the Champaign system, Champaign will transfer it to us. So you get to know. Um, where all these little places are and, and what people's addresses need because you can transfer those cases. Um, so we transfer cases in and out. We transfer cases um, back to the state of Illinois if they're out of state. So for example, we're really close to Indiana and um, we get a lot of you know people who are seen by a doctor in Kentland. So what will happen will, will be like Newton County would, would, would transfer that case back to the state of Illinois and the state of Illinois transfers it back. And usually that, that's pretty immediate. Um, we, we get it within a few hours. We've never seen problems about not, not receiving, you know, INET reports. It's a, it's a pretty good system. Um, the problem I have is reportability because if they're not held accountable to report it. Yeah. And that's why... How accurate is it? Kevin, that's exactly why the state mandated that the laboratories do it now instead of making... Because you... you know, it it's something. Yeah. <laughs> you go to a doctor and, and you'll notice that, for, for example, on HIV is on the list. Um, HIV rules and regulations are, are very different than, than communicable, other communicable disease rules and regulations. Um, HIV is reportable by law to your local health department, but it is not, um, it is not put on into the INED system. There's a separate system for cases like that. Now, let me give you an example of, of, of that, just so you know. I, I'm sorry, Troy, I know you've heard all this stuff a million times, but I'd like to explain this to the new board, to the new member, but that is, that's okay. Um, if someone has HIV, we're required by law to, to do their surveillance. You know, we can contact that person, we fill out all of their investigatory information. Um, but we refer almost all of our HIV cases to Champion and Manitoba Public Health District. Um, they are fabulous. Um, their administrator, Julie Pride, and I have a wonderful, wonderful working relationship. And we can usually arrange transportation very easily um, to get them there. Um, they have a, a full-time doctor on staff. They have nurses on staff. Um, you know, our health department has a total of, you know, right now 16 employees, whereas they have 130 employees. Um, they so we refer to them, our, our clients to them, and they just treat our, our residents just like they're their own. Um, they're, 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 it's wonderful to have that kind of a network. Um, but they make sure that, that um, if someone's HIV positive, you know, we, we may do the investigation and the surveillance work, but they make sure that the person is treated appropriately, given, you know, 
medication, um, the windows help stop the spread of the disease, um, how to protect the family members, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so they actually implement those prevention and control measures for us. Um, and then, of course, we just monitor that, you know, we just do surveillance monitoring. Um, but, it, but it works well. It works very well. And then in turn, when you get overwhelmed and, you know, like they had a mock outbreak last year and they needed nurses to kind of help get to give immunization, you know, I spent as many of us as I could. I, I, you know, I'm the administrator and still register nurse, so I, I, I myself and gave shots all day. Um, it, 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 it kind of works like, um, it's called an instrumental program. It's like the, the, the firemen have the MAVIS program where they help each other out by the fire district. The health departments do that as well. And we are very fortunate that our surrounding health departments are so, so supportive. And, and there's nothing I've ever asked of any of them. I've asked a lot of them. I'm a fairly new administrator. But they, they never turn me down. So we're very fortunate. Um, so, what I think a lot of people think of when they think of the health department is they think of that, you know, we're the ones that go in and do the restaurant inspections and the well inspections and the septic inspections. And they think of all those things, but they forget that we're out there every single day investigating diseases so that we can prevent the spread. Um, you can't prove a negative, right? So we can't tell you how many lives we've saved, and we can't tell you how many diseases we've prevented from being spread. But um, if you ever had time to sit down and listen to some of our stories, um, we, we spend our days protecting the residents of Iroquois County. Um, I've said many, many times, we are their invisible layer of protection. They don't even know what we're doing for them, but we're out there investigating the disease <coughs> that they're under control. <coughs> we don't. We put a lot of effort in making sure that that their family and their community is safe. Um, so um, a lot of people don't realize what we do. We don't. We do um, send out press releases when there are things that the public needs to be aware of. But there are a lot. Most of the things we don't. We don't want the public to be afraid to go to Walmart. We don't want the public to be afraid to go to Big R and Burkott and um, so we don't. Um, we're not always our best um, advocates because, you know, it, it's human nature to try to figure out who has who, who got it, you know. If, 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 you, if I told you that someone at what single high school had, had, you know, a specific disease, you know, people would start asking their kids who was absent, who was, you know, you, just, you, you have to be really careful about um, protecting the public but also protecting that person's right to private medical information as well. So I think we do a good job. Um, we don't have huge outbreaks, but we have been in outbreak status. We've even been in outbreak status in the last few months. We had um, some STD outbreaks that we had to work on. Um, that happened. Um, every winter we have norovirus outbreaks that we have to mitigate and investigate. Um, I don't ever remember, and, and I've worked in public health for almost 25 years, and I don't ever remember a winter where we didn't have an outbreak that we have to get under control. Um, if those outbreaks occur in a long-term care facility, like say a home of a home where people are very vulnerable, we have to get on that fast. Um, we go in, we do an environmental inspection to make sure that the illness is what we think it is. We do a minimum of five stool samples. We send those to the state laboratory um, so that we know what we're doing with. Um, if it's something like norovirus, um, then we go in and we teach the staff um, appropriate, you know, remind them of appropriate infection control measures, hand washing. Um, we go in and we, we watch them. The health department staff will watch them to help them, not not to, to, to find blame or point a finger, but to help them. A lot of times you'll find that they're scooping up ice with the same container and going room to room to room. You know, so um, you might say to them, you know, this is this is one way that you're spreading bacteria, and here's how we're going to help them stop that. 
um, sometimes we put um, implement prevention and control measures that actually um, you know quarantine someone. Um, you you isolate your ill, but you quarantine the people that um, have been exposed. So we may we may go in and we may you know put a quarantine notice on a on a facility and say you know restrict visitors unless absolutely <coughs> um, until until you're down to a certain number of, um, of people who are ill. So those are the things that we do on a continual basis. Um, so that annual report, um, you can compare that with the, with the figures I give you today and they'll show you where we were last year on our numbers and where we are this year on our numbers. But before we do that, I'm going to give you the, the actual grants and contracts list. And I did update this yesterday. I'm going to give you one too. All the grants and contracts that we have here at the health department are in. Um, we had months of waiting due to the lack of a state budget. We did not get dollar amount appropriations for our grants for a lot of them. Amanda, we do pass out here. Uh, no, that's okay. Um, so we didn't have appropriation amount, so we had to wait. Somebody, most of the time, most years in a typical year where there would be a state budget, you would, I would be writing most of my grants in, in March, you know, in the February, March, April. To get them in by May, so that they are turned back around to us by June, because most of our grants start on the on the state fiscal year, which is July 1st, and on July 1st and June 30th. So, um, the only grant, if you look at the grants, I, I have last year's grants and then this year's grants um, for comparison on on here. The only grant that, that the state discontinued was the Adult Protective Service Capacity Building Grant. It was a self-neglect grant. Um, mostly that grant was to help us go in and people who were hoarding, you know, because that can become a health issue really fast if they're hoarding while well, they also have rodents and cockroaches and other, other things. We knew that that was a one-year grant. We knew that. So, um, you know, it's not something that the state just Took away. It was it was a capacity building grant. That's what I called it. That. It was a one-year grant to help you get started, so that then you could, um, you know, continue to implement the missions that you that you began, um, you know, without funding. A lot of things that the state wants us to do are unfunded mandates, as you know. Um, so on your list, when it says at, on the underneath the, the grant amount, at, you know, at the top it'll have the, the grant dollars. It'll have the time frame that the grant is um, implemented. And then underneath that it'll either say submitted, contract signed, or contract finalized. And let me explain to you what the difference between that is when you look at this. If it says grant submitted, that means that, that we've submitted the grant and they have accepted it. Okay? If it says that the, the contract is signed, that means the grant has been approved and sent back to me for signature. If it says that the contract is finalized, then that means that the state has also signed off on it and I have a finalized contract. Okay. It takes, sometimes you'll get a finalized contract in the 11th month of a 12-year grant. But, I, excuse me, 12 months grant. That's not on time. That's just how the state works. Um, but it tells you where we're at. So what if it says IMH? Okay. So the Iroquois Memorial Hospital grant, um, we sub subcontracted um, our Family Case Management Program, the Healthy Families Online Program, and the WIT Program to Iroquois Memorial Hospital starting in July of 2014. And you can see that those are some pretty high dollar grants. <coughs> those grants, um, the health department was the grantee, and we just subcontracted it to IMH up until this year. And the reason that that changed this year is because the state of Illinois adopted the federal GATA um, Grant Accountability and Transparency Act. And with that act, it limits the amount of indirect costs that you're allowed. So um, a sub-awardee or a subcontractor of a grant, and the difference between a subcontractor is a subcontractor does part of the work, a sub-awardee does all the work. Well, Iroquois Memorial is a sub-awardee because they do all of the work. We don't 
for service for the people here. We're just the passengers. So what, so what happens with those is um, this year we just backed off of it um, because of the GATA requirement and the um, subawardees were only allowed to claim 10% of the grant amount in indirect costs up to the first $25,000 of a grant, which means you only get $2,500 of any grant for indirect costs. And by indirect costs, I mean things that can't link to that exact program and that program only. So shared things like, you know, phone lines and computers and, and copy machines and, and um, insurance and depreciation and all those things. So that meant a lot of grant dollars would not be able to be captured. So we decided, um, the, the Health Department, Board of Health decided um, at my recommendation that we just back off and let Israel Memorial Hospital apply for those grants directly. And that's what we did. And they were awarded Family Case Management and Healthy Families Illinois. Unfortunately, they became ineligible for the WIC program as a grantee because the state of Illinois no full process, the notice of funding opportunity process, does not allow new agencies to be eligible. It had to be an existing eligible, an existing agency. So we ended up having to keep that grant and then just sub-award it to your family law hospital in order to have those services in our community. So we weren't willing to let to, to risk letting those programs go. So right now, let me let you know a little bit about what's going on with WIC so that you're aware of that. <coughs> right now, this WIC grant began July 1st. Your from Mom Hospital is providing those services. Every, the last two years, we have up, the health department has paid them a percentage of the grant up front. And this year, we changed that. And so this year, our contract with Israel Memorial Hospital says that we will pay them once we are reimbursed, you know, immediately upon reimbursement. Well, we haven't been reimbursed anything since July 1st, not, not because there's not a state budget, because WIC is a federal grant, and that federal money should be coming through, but because with all the new VADA requirements, the expenditure documentation forms that we submit, they weren't. If there's the state's still trying to figure out how they how we do this with a with a with a uh, full sub award. I had another conference call yesterday with Stephanie Beth, she's the Department of Human Services WIC state WIC coordinator. And she's helping us work through that. We think we've got it worked through. We think within the next month we'll be able to send July, August, September, October, and November EDF then and get one big payment back. And we'll turn 100% of that payment over to your friend and hospital. The health department is not claiming any cost whatsoever. We could claim an administrative cost on that, but we don't. That's not our purpose. You know, and and um, so, so we're not going to do that. And that's the agreement that I made with Ryan um, H. If you look at these grants, you'll notice there, there's no grant for communicable diseases. There's no grant for wells and infections. All the things, I want to point out to the new members because you may not be aware of this, all the things that are required for us to be a certified local health department. Okay, there are six things required to be a certified local health department. You have to have a communicable disease program. You have to have um, food, well, septic, um, you have to have a TB program, <laughs> um, oh, immunization, I'm sorry. So there's no grants for those. Um, the state doesn't offer grants for those, there aren't private grants for those things. The things that it takes to be a certified local health department are paid for, almost always, are expected to be paid for through your local tax levy. And that's what our tax levy does. Um, it, it provides the non-essential, or, or excuse me, it provides the, the local tax levy provides the essential public health services. All of these grants are, are um, services that are not required to be a certified health department, but are, are grants that almost every health department in the state of Illinois has. 
Um, yeah. How are these amounts determined? Like for Danville, mm -hmm. Champaign County, Vermillion mm -hmm. or Vermillion County, mm -hmm. uh, and some of the other counties. How is that grant money? Is it the same for every? But how is it depend dependent on? The county population? Okay, that's a great question because every grant is different. <coughs> For example, your local health protection grant. The local health protection grant is the only grant that we can appropriate to local health protection. So some of those, some, that $3,201 goes to every, every county in the state of Illinois that has a population of 50,000 or under gets that same amount. So Ford County, who has half the population that you're focusing on still gets the sixty three thousand two hundred and one. It's a flat it's a flat so a flat amount. But a lot of the other ones, like for example our our dental sealant grant, um, that that goes by typically by your school enrollment. You know that our members went down to see that that that, that one went down from fifteen hundred dollars to a thousand. School enrollments are down. Um, the uh, Illinois Tobacco Free Communities went, to, you know, went from no, it, it remained the same, but it's based on uh, that's based on population. So every every single grant has its own mechanism. Thank. So Kankakee is going to be different than yeah, no, yeah, yeah. And Will County is going to be different too. Yes. Okay. Remember, I thought it was. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> you know, last year we we were told last year that, and I said this to the health committee many times that we were only going to get seventy six percent of some of these state grants because the state funding wouldn't be there. And then all of a sudden, as you all know, at the end of September we got we got it all in, and I was thrilled because we ended up with and you know almost three hundred thousand dollars worth of money that I didn't think we were going to get. So. You know, we were thrilled. Um, I, I had really um, put the staff in, in a position where they needed supplies and equipment and stuff, and we weren't ordering it because I didn't want to get to. I was afraid we would be in a situation that some of the other health departments were where we were going to have to lay off staff. And so we were diligent. Well, then at, at the end of September, boom, that money came through, and and we did we none of the health departments in the state were notified that that money was going to come until. Like a day or two with the cane. So we were thrilled with that. Um, will that happen again this year? I'm not going to count on it. I'm just not. I'm, I'm not going to count that, that we're going to end up with 100% of our, of our, you know, the grant that we have. Did the state give you a payday date? Well, typically what they do is they, we, we submit an expenditure documentation form to them on the 15th of every month for most of these programs. Some, some, some are a little bit different, but most of them it's the 15th of the month for the previous month's services that we've done. And then usually the turnaround is a month or two before we get payment for some of them. Last year, when the state wasn't paying you know, for all those months and a lot of health departments went without, um, our cash balance got down below, way below 500000 So. Um, you, 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 it fluctuates, you know. That's that's something that um, you know we just have to be prepared for. Um, but typically, if if we had a state budget and the state comptroller's office was paying us, the turnaround on most of the grants would be you know 30, 60, 90 days. But unfortunately, last year that just didn't happen because. And I, we've been told, everybody knows that, that the, the House Amendment 5, um, that we were guaranteed the soft gas budget runs through December 31st. After December 31st, there are no guarantees. I, I'll be honest with you, I don't expect payments after January 1st. I'll be as shocked as anybody if we get that, but um, we'll see what happens. Fortunately, we have a cash balance that can be so no, do you have to stay on top? Do you have to keep pounding these state people? Well, I, 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 um, I do. Not because I have to, because once you, 
um, put in your expenditure documentation form and the plan is sitting there, um, it'll be issued a warrant, and that warrant goes to the, to the comptroller's office. Um, I can look online to the state of the Illinois comptroller's office and see where our payments, whether our payments have been approved, not approved, <coughs> whether they're sitting there waiting to be payment, you know, I, I, can, I can see the status of those payments. So I, I check that, you know, very, very frequently. Um, so it's on their payroll. Yeah, it's on their payroll. So I don't have to have them. But I do, but I did, I did become a member of the state legislative committee for of the Illinois um, Public Health Association. So I'm on, it's like you're my health committee, I'm on the state legislative committee that helps get some of this history through. So, um, hopefully, um, when things go through, and, and, and I'll be honest with you that um, Dan, last year, they asked us, um, the, Illinois, the IAPHA, the Illinois Association of Public Health Administrators, that you know, we all sit down as a group, and, and um, you know, there's 90 some health departments in the state of Illinois, and we all sit down as a group and said, okay, once the state releases these funds to IDPH, IDPH wants a priority list who gets paid for it first. I, 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 I did tell them, we're doing okay. You know, you need to, to pay this health department first. They, they laid off 50% of their staff. You know, they've got no, nobody out there, you know, doing communicable diseases. And we know that those communicable diseases don't stop at county lines. So we got to help our neighbors out a little bit. So I said, you know, put us at the bottom of the list. You know, with a lot of, you know, yes, county board members, do you want a health department administrator saying that? No. Probably not. But, but, <laughs> but, we're looking at money. But, um, but usually what, what happens is they'll pay it as they get it in, and we'll have it within 30 days after they start making those payments. So can we can we wait 30 days for that payment? It doesn't it, it means we're still gonna get it. We're guaranteed that once it's released. But um, you know, if they need to pay another health department for um, so once the contract is signed, you're going to get the money eventually. Yes. And that contract can only be used for whatever you have described on the contract. Absolutely. You, you can't take. I cannot take. Uh, dental sealant money and, and use it for the lead program. I can't take... So what happens if you don't use that grant money? It, it lays on the table. Um, we, we really do... Uh, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I, I promise the board, you know, the board when they hired me, I promised the board of health transparency. I promised the county board transparency. There are times we don't claim every dollar. Um, the Illinois Breast and Cervical Program, it's impossible. To claim, to claim every dollar. You, the, the, the hoops you've got to jump through to get some of that money is unbelievable. It's just not possible. You don't have the staff, you don't have the, you know. Um, so some, some, some grant money ends up... Um, so when you say it lies on the table, what happens? We didn't capture it. It goes back to the state. Um, so does that affect our grant request next time for that particular... That's a wonderful question. For the most part, it does not because the grants are still for the next year be based on the population or based on their numbers that you had or whatever. Um, some of them do. Um, public health emergency preparedness money tends to be that way. If you don't capture it all, they don't give you as much the next year. It, it, it's not that that's written anywhere. We've noticed it. Um, so, because that happened at, with the, the board of the public health department. Um, there was money that wasn't captured, and this year the grant amount went down. Um, even if it went down a little bit, you know, this year, even though we had captured it all, I've tried to make sure that money not captured. Um, we, I work very diligently to try to capture every dollar we can capture. Um, but you're never going to um, meet every single grant deliverable on every grant. Sometimes it's just not possible. Um, for example, um, the WIC grant. IMH does that. But in order to capture all that money, you'd have to meet a caseload where you brought in every single eligible person who's eligible for WIC and for services. You're not going to get every person in 
Yeah. It, it's like now he's eligible to come for a service. That's, that's just not going to happen. It, it, you have to be realistic. So, so we, we, we we definitely work very hard to capture as much um, of that grant money as we can because that means more services for the residents of Detroit County and it protects their health, it protects, you know, it protects their safety. <coughs> so we work very hard to do that. Anybody have any more questions about the, the grant for I would, I welcome any of you any time to come in and talk to you and talk about specific grants, what they do, how they work, um, what we do for people. We love to, we love to tell you what we do. Um, the next thing that I have for you is the summary report of program. I'll send them both ways. Um, end up with an extra one the end up um, the card. Okay. okay, that'd be great. I can give some fun find them to Marvin here too. <laughs> so, so um, um with the summary of the program. So, so next month when we get it it'll just have December. Um, and then, and then, then every month we add to it. So you, you actually have a full a full year. You have an extra month day. I'll give it um, those are the, the services that we um, provide and the numbers. So if you really wanted to compare where we're at from last year, you would take our annual report from last year and look at the numbers in that and, and could compare it to where we're at this year. And you'll see that some things, our numbers are higher and some things, our numbers are lower. I'll give you a few examples of that. Um, one of the things where, where um, you know, our numbers are higher are permits that were issued for, for food, uh, food sanitation programs. Um, we had uh, 159 last year, and this year, in this year 16, we had 199. Um, so, a lot more permits were issued. What does it mean by a re-inspection? A re-inspection means someone has typically not had um, their first inspection or they had enough um, violations or, or even a critical violation that we need to go back to make sure it's corrected. And that happened. Oh yeah, son. Um, I'll give you an example where our numbers went down and why. Under childhood immunization, um, um, this year we did 629 and last year we did over 800. Because last year the state of Illinois changed their regulations for school children and implemented the meningitis vaccine and so forth. So we had all, all those kids to vaccinate last year where we didn't have that this year. So there are always reasons why the numbers go up or down. And if you ever find a discrepancy and want to know the rationale behind that, just ask. I'll be happy to, to explain that to you. So the numbers for November look light all the way through the year, not all the or is it that, that light? No, it was that light. And, and I, Troy, I questioned the same thing. One of the things I said to Terry was, okay, so for, but you also have to realize too that we are down a staff member. Um, we um, have an open position in our environmental health department for a, 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 a minimum an associate sanitarian and what I'd really like to do is call a sanitarian. Um, so right now, and then during the month of November, our part-time person, Donna Falconier, um, was on vacation and, ha and her mother passed away. And so we were down staff. So obviously we don't accomplish as much when we're down staff, down staff. Um, so those numbers will pick back up, you know. And some of the, the um, inspections, you know, if some place has to be inspected um, twice a year, it can be done early. You know, Terry did so many more in um, October because he knew was going to be on vacation in November. And we knew that we were short of that. So we can make adjustments for that. But yeah, Troy, you're exactly right.
Uh, but, I mean, you, I mean, it's down a lot. Uh huh. And but where, I mean, what, what, at what point would you consider laying off a person or something? No, no and I'll explain that. Look under private sewage disposal. Look under those inspections. Terry focused a lot more on sewage than he was on food in November. Yeah. 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 We're, we're, you know, normally five a month, he went up three times. A yeah. So, so different times of the year, you focus on different things. For example, um, the nursing staff. They typically are very, very busy during um, October because the immunizations are due for the, the school kids' physicals to school by October 15th. So at the beginning of October is very, very busy for that. The flu season is typically very busy um, uh, with flu shots. But you look at the other months and there'll be zero flu shots. Because you're not you're giving too many flu shots in May, May and June, you know. So a lot of our, our of what we do at the health department is seasonal. If you look at the West Nile virus surveillance, all of it is, is June, July, or August. Obviously we're not out there right now setting on the here. We, we are cyclic, so um, on the months when we're doing focusing on one thing, the next month we may be focusing on a totally different health issue. It might be helpful for that reason, just to see what last year looked like, I guess, it, it, it does vary by moment. Uh -huh. And you can tell that right in here. In, okay. in here, it has all the same okay. numbers. Okay. No, that's okay. But, um, that's one of the reasons I gave this to you. So you can read a little bit about our program, but you can also look at the same number, and they go in the same order. Okay, and you can compare what, what that fiscal year ended up like to what this fiscal year ended up like. I thought that maybe that would help you. We'll put international travel conversation. When someone um, calls the health department, what they'll say is, um, I'm traveling to Brazil, and um, I need to know what shots I need to go to, to get into the country. And so what we do, Kevin, is pretty cool, actually. We do, um, I, I contact David Hennings at the, at the Illinois Department of Public Health, and he sends me a, a packet for that person. It not only tells them what shots they need in order to, to, to get into the country um, for, for, for travel to make it through, through their um, their station, but it also tells them what diseases are going on in the country, what areas those diseases are happening in, what things that they even that aren't required but are recommended. Maybe it's recommended that they take malaria pills. Um, they might need a you know typhoid medication. It also tells them whether there's any kind of a political conflict going on in that country and where where it's safe to be and where it's not safe to be. Um, it, it will give them, it will tell them what foods to avoid, where foodborne, what foodborne illnesses in that country are, are, um, So that's no cost to the, the person requesting it that no. comes out of your budget? Yeah. We just, um, we do it as part of our time. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Yeah, if there's anything on this um, report of programs that you want to know more about what we do for that, um, please feel free to ask. I'd love to explain that to you. I can keep you here for hours and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> if I want to. <laughs> A lot of it is self-explanatory, but... Um, we did get more flu and pneumonia shots this year than we did last year, which we were very pleased about. One of the things that we implemented this year for the new for the new members is typically the health department had never been able to bill in private insurances. And so now, because the Lincoln Memorial Hospital decided <coughs> and let us know in August that between October and December they would not be getting uh, vaccinations anymore. They were going to get out of the vaccine business. They wanted to know if we, we can handle their clients. Um, we told them that we absolutely would and could. One of the things we knew when that was coming was we decided to take people's insurance. So we had we, we contracted with a company called CDT and they do our insurance billing help us with that. Um, and we now are able to take Blue Cross Blue Shield, Health Alliance, Aetna, United Healthcare, all of those things. So people that have to upfront the cost of those vaccines and then get a receipt from us and have to turn in their their insurance and then wait to get something with that. Um, you know, if you've got children, um, vaccines can be very expensive. 
you know, even people from a flu shot, you've got a family of four and flu shot is very tough. But that's $140 for the family to have to come up with. So do you advertise you do this? Like, I shouldn't say advertise. We, say we've done press releases. We've we 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 talked some really good about, um, you know, about putting that in the paper. Um, so, so we think that, um, but we just, remember, we just, we just just started. So we just got our United Health Department Care contract in on October 31st. So, so that's, that's big in this area. So it's the cross the shield. So, so we, we're just beginning this. So it'll so be people, interesting. If people ask me, I can say, yes, our public health department can do that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good thing to know. Yeah. Um, and we have had a lot of people, especially the flu season, who are so grateful um, that, that we can take their insurance and they didn't have to come up with a front of that money. So, next year it will be interesting to see what our numbers are. You know, when I was trying to create our budget for next year, it's very difficult to predict. How do you predict how many people are going to come in for, for, for those things? Um, so I looked at patterns and trends um, for the surrounding health departments. I looked at pattern, our patterns and trends. I looked at, I asked your friend of my hospital for their information about in, in and kind of did put all that together and made a best guess. <laughs> Um, under this uh, dental program, how in the world, why does this March and April have the two large numbers? Yeah, because the dental sealant program, we contract with a company called Miles and Smile, and they come to our schools in this area in March and April every They come to the school. To the school. And a uh, 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 one. If it was one, that would be the whole class? Well, uh, no. A whole, uh, like, second graders? The, the, the All of the second graders? The dental sealant program, no, that's not how that works. The dental sealant program works providing dental sealant for children who have a medical card who do not have access to it, their own dentist. So we're not hurting the local dentist. That would never be our purpose to take away. We're trying to supplement um, for those people who can't. Um, most of the local dentists do take people with medical cards, but they have a limited number that they can take because um, they actually lose money on it. So a lot of children who have a medical card can't get in to see a dentist um, in a timely fashion. Um, now, don't get me wrong, the dentists in this area are terrific. I can make one phone call to, to, to any of the three dentists that are in Air Force County and, and, and ask them to see a child, you know, because I got a referral from one of our school nurses. They will take them. Don't, don't get me wrong. They are fabulous. But these are the routine things, and these are parents that aren't established at one of these dentists' offices already. and so. We have a mobile dental unit that comes around and it does the cleanings and the exams and the dental sealants. Right in the school. Right, school. Right, 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 right in the school for the right kids. School. Mm -hmm. and, they and they don't turn, and let me tell you something else about Miles with Miles. They don't turn anyone away. So let's just say that my child wanted that. Um, we have dental insurance here, you know. Um, I, I have it for my husband actually, but they wouldn't qualify to be seen under this grant program, right? The dentist from Miles for Smiles, his name is Dr. Trost, he will see any kid that wants to see. Any parent that fills out the form, he doesn't turn them away. So, so any, so, but uh, for our numbers, the, the numbers that you see here are the numbers that we could fill using the grant dollars. Each number represents one yes, child? One child. Thank you. Because when the grant dollars run out, Dr. Trost will still see them as well. And we just don't call them on our account. And you know, we don't send it that they state for reimbursement because we're not going to get it, you know. But um, he's wonderful. Such a kind, caring, compassionate man. So do you choose what doctor actually does those services, or how is that? Well, I'll tell you how I did that, Kevin. I'm just curious. No, because there are lots of different services, and we get called. There are probably at least 
three or four in the state of Illinois that would come to Iroquois County and service our children, okay. mobile dental units. Mm -hmm. I decided to go with Miles with Miles because for many years I was contracted as through the health department as the Unit 9 school nurse. And um, I worked with several different ones that we had and I found these to be the most compassionate. Um, I'm not questioning that. With. I'm just no. asking how what the system is so and how you do it. I just picked one. Okay. I just simply I picked the one that I thought <sighs> and I knew that Dr. Coach would see anyone and he wouldn't turn any child away. And um, whether they had insurance or didn't have insurance, if the parents wanted them to fill out the form and send that back to school, he saw it. And I think that it's so valuable not to, to turn anyone away. So one more silly question. It's okay. They're not silly. What is a canning inspection? Um, well, the canning facilities in the, in the, in the county, the places that have that you pay, women would pay or men would pay to go in. Like a beauty salon or yeah. something? Yeah. Anybody that has a tanning, a tanning service, we go in and we inspect the tanning bed. What would you inspect it for? To make sure that sanitation. For sanitation and to make sure that the light bulbs aren't burning people and, you know, people. Uh, safety issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Huh. Okay, yeah, thank you. That. Just like we do the garbage truck, people don't realize that. We do, we do so many things that people don't really realize that we do. Um, it was a great episode on Seinfeld one. What, what talk about a standing bed? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> we don't have any, you see body art inspection zero. Right now, we don't have any tattoo parlors that I'm aware of in here for Floyd County that are they're doing that. But we have in the past that they closed down. So if we get a body art that you mean legal ones. Legal ones, yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um that's so important. A few years ago, I don't give you an example of that a few years ago we had a just a huge tremendous hepatitis C outbreak. This has been quite a few years ago. And when we were doing our investigations, one of the things, you know, we asked people, have you had a cat do? Have you done this? You know. So one of, the, one of the common denominators we found with all these people was that they were getting tattoos and they were getting, getting them at a specific place. So we contacted the state. The state had sent a team up. They were not, um, they were not autoclaving their equipment properly. They were literally washing their tattooing equipment in a sink and using a machine that was very similar to a seal meal. I know which one I'm talking about. And, um, and when that place finally ended up shutting down because they couldn't afford the other place, um, properly sterilized the equipment, the hepatitis C case started, never started. I can give you a thousand examples of things like that, but um, what we do does make a difference with people's health. It really does. Every day. Well, thank you very much for your education and information. Appreciate it. Yep. If there's ever a topic that you want to hear more about, um, I'd be happy to do that. And my door's always open. Please come see us. Um, just to let you know about a couple a couple of little last little things. Our audit is complete. We had to have a single audit that was separate from the county audit. And we weren't notified of that for the Department of Human Services for our our three services that we subcontract to IMH last year. <coughs> we weren't aware that we had to have this. Um, we notified it Anita. She worked very hard. She did. She worked very hard to get um, Clifton Marks and Allen the county's auditing company to do a single audit for that and to um, to give us an agreement for a agree upon procedures um, so that did get taken care of and has been completed. Um, tomorrow I'm sending a staff to um, TD training and sure we've read the paper about all the you know, new medicinal resistant strains of TD and XVR TD, the extremely drug resistant TD cases that are out there in neighboring counties. Um, we'll, we'll have all staff safety training um, this month. I think I have a, a agenda here kept up around. I'll show you if I can 
come up with what I think what they want to have here. That's scary. I can pass that around that. What we'll be trained on at our all staff safety training. And once again, we have an open position at the health department. So if you know of anyone, uh, the minimum requirements are 30 semester hours or 45 quarter hours of sciences, college sciences. They have to have college sciences in the biological, chemical, and physical areas. I've even had a nurse apply for this position and um, I called the department. Aren't these all required by IDPH? Yeah. Um, Nurses meet the biological requirements that they take in, you know, microbiology and physiology one and two, all those things. They meet the chemical science requirement if they take in college chemistry, which all nurses have. But most nurses don't meet the physical requirement because they haven't taken physics or geology or, or, or the physical sciences. So um, these people typically, in order to fill this position, are going to need typically an environmental science degree, not just a bachelor's in science. Um, they're very hard to find because um, a lot of times those people can go to companies and get big, big, big money. So we've chosen to, to extend our um, application on the website and we're started, we, we chose to, to start advertising elsewhere too. We've used a lot of free advertisement, like Indeed.com and, and things like that, but we're um, advertising in the News Gazette and some of the bigger papers, too. Um, hopefully, that position will be filled when we have some interviews next week. So I'll keep you informed on that. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. <coughs> Anything else? Any questions? Next item of business, or is there any old business to come before the committee? Fair enough. I'll ask for new business. New business. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Seconded. All in favor to adjourn, say aye. 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 aye.